James the Cyclist asks, uh, he said, I recently had to fix my 77 MGB out on the road when it overheated. Been there. Was it your thermostat? Um, and with some quick thinking and a bit of copper and tin snips, I got it home. That's interesting. I'm kind of curious what that repair was. Um, James the Cyclist wants to know, what's my best or worst redneck style botched fix? We've all been there once or twice. So when I first moved to San Francisco, I was working for Chico McMurtry, a robot artist, uh, proprietor of Amorphic Robot Works, now of Red Hook, Brooklyn. Amorphic Robot, in San Francisco in the early 90s was packed with machine artists and kinetic sculptors. Mm. Survival Research Laboratories was by far the most famous, and if you haven't heard of them, go look them up. If you're watching me right now, you are exactly the kind of person who will love Survival Research Labs. Big machines that destroy each other. Um, they would do shows in San Francisco that were always against the law. Every time they did a show, Survival Research Labs uh, founder Mark Pauline and his production manager Mike Dingle would have to spend a night in jail. It was literally like an arrangement they had. Um, they, their shows were anti-narrative, which was my singular problem with them, but the, the, the spectacle was glorious and the stuff they built was insane. Um, car tires that um, shot two by fours at hundreds of miles an hour and stuff like that. The other side of the equation was Chico McMurtry's Amorphic Robot Works, where these robots that Chico built, they had sex, they played drums, they crawled through muck, they gave birth to each other. It was very organic. It was very... Uh, it was very uh, uh, primordial. And um, Chico had this ancient beater of a tiny pickup truck, like the mid 80s Toyotas, those ones that like four people could lift. This is the exact kind of pickup truck I grew up in. I can't remember if Chico's was actually a Toyota or an old Nissan or something, but it was barely running. And it was called the Kunstmobil. Kunst is German for art. Uh, it was called the Kunstmobil, and I think it was spray painted on the side, Kunstmobil. And we were in North Beach, and Chico's, right now I'm remembering, his starter motor solenoid had burned out. And the starter motor solenoid is the thing that when you add power to the starter motor, it goes out to engage the starter motor. And once the starter motor spins up to speed, it retracts again. And it's a key part of using your starter motor. And when it goes out, you can start your car, but then your motor's engaged the whole time. Um, and so the, in order to deal with that, instead of getting a new solenoid, because that was not feasible at that moment, Chico had a switch on the dashboard, literally like, a toggle switch, and I'm talking, I think, like a house toggle switch. And it was like, engage to start, disengage once the car is running, because you want you didn't want to burn out the starter motor. Of course, we're in North Beach when somebody starts the car by hitting that switch and they forget to disengage it, and we drive somewhere, nobody notices the extra noise of the starter motor burning itself out, and then we smell a smell, and it it turns out that uh, the starter motor is totally burnt out. So how are we gonna get this car going? Yes, we could roll start it. Um, but in the end, we ended up, yeah, something fried and something shorted. And so part of the wiring harness got actually burnt. And we're sitting there in North Beach with this brick of a truck when uh, our friend Gio, uh, is a preternaturally good electrical engineer, um, stood there with lamp cord and literally bypassed the wiring harness to get just the parts of the car that needed to run so that we could get home. And it was like one wire went over here and one wire went over here and that got us the thing we needed to do that. And that was all, you know, fuel and fire. That was all we needed. And we got that car home. It was about a 45 minute fix in the dark. Sorry, somebody has arrived. Now I'm like sitting, I can see the front door. Who is it? Thank you. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, I've been part of a lot of, uh, a lot of redneck style fixes, but that was, that was a particularly, spe particularly spectacular one. Um, 
Adam G says, do you have any suggestions for tabletop storage system? I only have a small wooden table to work from. I have everything split, spread out in a first order retrieval system, but I want something that goes higher that I could possibly label. Well, I mean, Adam G, I think you're, you're, you're answering your own question. Um, if you have a 3D printer, building storage for your building storage for a desktop is a really a great thing to do with a 3D printer. Uh, you just go slow and steady over time. Um, but I wanted to mention one thing about a table, tabletop storage system. Um, because I have this shop, but I also have a desk in my office at home, and I do do some work at that desk. It has a complement of tools in it. Um, and I've discovered over the years of using a desk in my office at home that one of the most important aspects of tabletop working is to have a tabletop trash bin. I have this little, I think it's a bento box that I lost the top of. It's about this big, and it sits on my desk uh, on my, at my house, and I empty it like every two weeks, but it's just for those little, when you're taking something apart and you got that little, mm -mm, instead of having to get up and going over to the garbage can, I have this thing right here and it makes my flow so much better. I wanted to let you know about that. Um, as far as tabletop storage systems, I don't know what you're storing. If it's long, it'll need to be stored vertically. If it's short, you might be able to store it horizontally. And if you're, if, if it's still an open question, I might try just building one shelf and seeing how it integrates and then going from there. Um, it is really important with any shelf system that you build um, to make sure that the shelves have backs so things can't roll and fall behind them. That is hard won knowledge, I'm telling you right now. Um, it is important to be rigorous about what you do and don't need. As a completionist, I love setting up a toolbox with everything I could ever need. And in the end, I only use 20% of those tools. And I end up often scrapping chunks of an organizational system because I've tried to do too much at once. That is absolutely how my brain works. Um, so I might try with a simple shelf. You might even like put it up on, get a wooden board and a couple of bricks and try and see how that helps your process. Um, you might also, you can hit the uh, power strip next to the compressor. Now that I'm closer to the compressor, it's actually inhibiting our, there we go. Um, yeah, put a, put a board on a couple of bricks and try that out. Maybe even get some storage bins from the dollar store. Like I love cheap solutions that help you understand what the actual solution should be. Um, there's one question I wanted to finish on, uh, and it is um, clay nations, clay tations, clay tations. I'm making, I'm making out of my dorm room. What advice do you have for working out of a small space that's also a living space? And also, how do I motivate myself to clean at the end of a long day? Well, I think, Again, that the last question you have is the answer to the first question that you have. What advice do I have for working in a small space that's also your living space? Rigorous organization and cleaning. And how do you, how do I motivate myself? I'll be honest with you that easily half the time I don't motivate myself to sweep up at the end of the day. Is it about half? Maybe it's slightly less than half. There are plenty of days I leave this cave in a state that I will have to take care of tomorrow. And sometimes I come in and I'm like, ah, inertia. But what's happening when I do is that I'm thinking of future me and I'm thinking of that pleasurable moment in which tomorrow morning's version of me will walk through the door and see this big empty space and think, oh, what can my hands start to do here now? That bifurcation of the self into present you, future you. And believe me, I spend way too much time thinking about past me. Uh, that thinking of future you, future me will be very happy tomorrow morning when I've got to get this thing done. Waking up in a clean space is such a big deal. It's really hard, you're in a dorm room, so I'm gonna guess you're in your 20s. It's plausible, let's say. Um, and in your 20s also, all this 
prefrontal cortex myelination is still happening. You're still effectively an adolescent until your mid to late 20s, specifically. And so it's also going to be hard to motivate your brain to do those things against the pleasure center. Because when you're at an adolescent, that pleasure center, man, there are moments you have had as a teenager that are the greatest you'll ever feel in your whole life, specifically because of the chemistry of how human brains work. And that's fine. Um, it's great that you're asking these questions this young. And my answer to working out of a small space is rigorous cleanliness and systems that aid and abet that cleanliness. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects questions you get to ask direct questions during my live streams and we have some members only videos including the adam real-time series of unbroken unedited shots of me working here in the shop they are weirdly meditative thank you guys so much i'll see you on the next one